Hello and welcome to Voice of Russia's political discussion program, Debating Russia. I'm Peter Lavelle. It is all but a done deal. The Crimea has returned to Russia. So what's next for Ukraine and East-West relations? To discuss this and more, my guests in London, Christopher Walker. He's the former head of the Times Bureau in Moscow. We have Alexander McCurris. He's a legal expert and commentator on Skype. Graham Phillips, he's a British journalist in Ukraine. And sitting next to me here in Moscow is Dmitry Bobic. He's a commentator for Voice of Russia. Uh, Christopher Walker, let me go to you first. <laughs> so what is next? Because the agreement be- between Russia and the Crimeans are, it's it's a process of dotting the I's and crossing the the T's now. I mean, I think that's a done deal. I think uh, perhaps the most ominous question about what next is, will things remain relatively calm as they have so far, you know, only one death, I think, or will these incidents with the Ukrainian Mm -hmm. forces uh, that we've seen since the uh, referendum start escalating, and will that lead to something unfortunate which could then escalate further? So that's uh, the side that's really worrying people. Uh, Frankly, in Britain, many people realize that Crimea is a done deal, um, despite all the hot air you hear in the House of Commons. And the real uh, question is, behind closed doors, is did Mr. Putin really mean what he said when he said the appetite was satisfied, he wanted no more of Ukraine. And that's where all eyes uh, in the West are really now is. I I think they've all given up on Crimea. You know, they'll huff and puff and uh, perhaps a few more people will be stopped going on shopping expeditions to Harrods. But uh, the thing is, will the East uh, stay as it is in an uneasy position with the Russian speakers? Uh, uh, And nobody can answer that. (laughs) No one can answer that, and that's why we're going to go to Graham Phillips now in Ukraine. What are the sensibilities of the Ukrainians right now? Well, I mean, I spent the last week traveling some 2,500 miles around the east of Ukraine to really get that exact idea of what sentiment, of what desire there is to be a part of Russia. So I went to Nikolaev, uh, Kherson, uh, Donetsk, Lugansk, Kharkiv, Mariupol. (laughs) And these are places which you can say traditionally are associated with pro-Russian sentiment. But the picture is very complex in modern Ukraine. You really do get the sense of a deep divide and of people that have been forced into camps. So whereas before Ukraine got by as a nation, now you really feel that people have been polarized into those pro-Russian and into those pro-Ukrainian. I filmed a little clip in Donetsk in Lenin Square there of one woman saying that this is Russia and the other arguing and saying, no, this is Ukraine. So you really get a sense, even in these uh, places such as Donetsk, which is associated really with very strong pro-Russia sentiment um, of a divide there. If some people do want to be a part of Russia, but um, from my uh, surveys, from my speaking to these hundreds of Ukrainians, I would say naturally the only place that you would think could go into Russia without any degree of uh, bloodshed, which of course there was in Donetsk and in Kharkiv just the day after I was there, in fact, uh, in both of these places last week and it had seemed calm, would probably be Lugansk. In Lugansk, I got a sense of some 75 plus percent of people um, as being, and of course, that borders uh, right on Russia. A huge majority there is being pro-Russia. In Mariupol, likewise. In Donetsk, in Kharkiv, it's a more complicated picture. You do have those before that were a part of Ukraine, but they do now feel that they're in camps and they're sometimes even together. They're sometimes the same family and they're sometimes the same the same couple. Um, Ukraine really feels now like a country in uh, in conflict. Alexander, if I can go to you in London, what Graham has said is extremely interesting to me because let's go back to November. Could any of us imagine having this conversation right now about what Graham said, you know, we have not only regions apart, we have even communities apart, even, you know, couples apart. This sounds very much like when the Soviet Union was invaded by Nazi Germany when Ukrainians chose sides here. How do you reflect upon that, Alexander? Well, to go back to your uh, question in November, no, I could not have imagined the situation. The reason we are in this situation is because it has been catastrophically mishandled. If we go back to November, um, there was a suggestion at the time of the association agreement when it was when the Yanukovych government stopped it for tripartite discussions involving Russia. If that had happened, we would not be in the situation now. We've also had over a three-month period protests in Kiev, which frankly did not take into account the divisions of the 
the country, a, pro- a procession of European dignitaries and American dignitaries going to Kiev, supporting one side in a conflict, not looking at the constitutional or democratic regalities that we're hearing so much about now, ignoring entirely the feelings of people in the eastern Ukraine. So this has been a catastrophically mishandled situation. And I agree with Christopher about this. The question now is whether we can somehow put it all together again. And I think that is really what the discussion is all about now. Demon, one of the things that the primary thing I'm worried about is I want to talk about my theory is that the Crimea has been taken off the chessboard, as it were. But I'm still very concerned about the East and the South because there is a demonstration effect here. Um, If they can get independence and accession to Russia, why can't millions of other Russians do the same thing? No, I mean, it's very difficult to make predictions right now because I agree with you, Peter. In December, no one would think we would have this uh, conversation in March. In fact, if you had shown me a video of this conversation, I would think that this is some kind of a, uh, a non-scientific fantasy uh, from Kiev or from uh, Like, a, like a, Ukraini- or a Ukrainian version of House of Cards. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but uh, I may be wrong, but I don't really think that Putin is after new territories and uh, I think we can believe him when he says that he won't go into any further regions of Ukraine after Crimea. And the reasons are not just political. First, you know, so far I never spotted Putin lying. I mean, it never happened that he would say, I would not go there and and then he would go somewhere else. And uh, with uh, the east of Ukraine, you know, the problem is that it's going to be an economic burden on Russia. These regions, and that's a tragedy of Ukraine, these regions, which used to be the industrial heartland of the former Soviet Union and which used to be much more profitable economically than the center or the west of Ukraine. Now, you know, Donetsk is living from, you know, it, it's, it's a loss making region. Part of it is due to the fact that prices for coal and for steel, you know, the two main Ukrainian industrial products have gone down. And plus they have competition from their Russian competitors across the border. And this is something also, that... So, yes, yeah. don't forget that the big steel plant in, in Krivarish, Krivarozhye in Russian, was bought by Metal Steel, so there, there would be also complications of that character. No, I don't really believe that it's possible that this process will go any further than Crimea. Crimea is already a very good lesson to the new Ukraine leadership, I would point your attention to the fact that just yesterday, Yatsenyuk, you know, the new prime minister said that Russian would be the second official (coughs) language in the east of Ukraine. Again, if you had told me that Mm -hmm. two weeks ago, before the Crimean operation, I would say that this is a hoax. This is not true. Yatsenyuk cannot say anything like that after Maidan. You're listening to Voice of Russia's political discussion program, Debating Russia. I'm Peter Lavelle. Uh, Christopher, my secondary concern here, or second concern, is what happens to the rest of Ukraine? Because Dima, sitting next to me, is is absolutely correct. Because we have an interim government there that does not have legal legitimacy. It is represented by individuals that never would have been able to be in a position of power if there had been an election. What I worry about is that, you know, the Western mainstream media looks at all the uh, Ukrainians are reacting to Crimea, but I'm more worried about how the rest of the Ukrainians, and some of them Russian speakers and Russians, are going to deal with each other. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, we've tended to forget uh, by, you know, in the West, by accusing Putin of sort of rigging uh, a phony referendum, that we've got sitting in Kiev a completely un democratic government that's been elected by nobody and whatever people may say about it being Nazi and anti-Semite they certainly include some of them because we've seen them on British television pacing up and down in their rather ridiculous uniforms and there are I think one question mark we haven't raised yet which is uh, very uh, big this morning in the New York Times and a point I hadn't quite realised is that 80% of the water and electricity in Crimea yes. comes from Ukraine. Should we call it Ukraine proper for the sake of language? What's going to happen there? Are they going to turn their taps off like Russia was once going to turn the gas taps off the other way? Uh, this has got uh, endless 
consequences. And I agree with you that not only what's going to happen in the rest of Ukraine is questioning us, but what's going to happen in the rest of the region? You know, uh, lots of minorities now, like in you know, Armenia mm-hmm. and places, might say, look, I don't want to stay under that government. I don't like it. I want to go back to sort of motherland. Uh, in, uh, there are various split nations all over Europe and further afield. So I think it could have extraordinary consequences. Graham, it's very important that we hear your opinion on this because I am not in Ukraine and our, our other guests are not in Ukraine. Tell us about these ultra-nationalists and neo-fascists that we hear so much about going from west to east. Um, I mean, to come back to this idea of when it began, I was in uh, Nikolaev, which was, of course, one of the Soviet Union's main shipbuilding centres uh, on November the 24th, which was the first uh, Euromaidan Sunday. And there was a very small demonstration there in between, on one side, you have a statue to the paratroopers, the Soviet paratroopers who liberated the city uh, from the Nazis in World War II. On the other side, you had a huge uh, Lenin statue, which has been in the city for uh, over 50 years. And you didn't really imagine that Euromaidan would ever touch either of those. But it's it's touched both, because in Nikolai, you have no Lenin. Uh, he was, of course, taken down on the 22nd. And what you now have next to the monument for the Soviet paratroopers is uh, St. George ribbon there, um, anti-fascist slogans, um, and there's a, mm. there's a settlement there of anti-fascists saying that they'll defend their monuments um, and their history against what they say and what they see um, as terrorists. And this has happened in places that you really wouldn't have expected, such mm. as Dnipropetrovsk, which has a population mm. of a million, of course. It was a former closed city, a Soviet munitions center. A- and Lenin's statue went there, and that's now being daubed as a monument to the uh, Heavenly 100. Uh, of course, these men who died in uh, Euromaidan, of course, the first uh, Sergei Nagoyan, who actually came from the Dnipropetrovsk area himself. So what you've really seen is these pockets of ultra-nationalism bringing up from areas that you just would not have expected uh, that to happen in. Um, and so you've seen uh, this toppling of the Lenin statues. You've seen this mobilization of Svoboda, who actually announced the week before the Lenin statues fell that they were going to be deploying effectively mobile units. And a lot of these cities do feel that people came from outside of their city mm. and destroyed their monuments. But what you do also have in places that you wouldn't really have thought that would exist before is very strong pro-Ukrainian nationalism, which I mean, I was speaking to a man in Kherson, a Ukrainian man in his 50s, quite respectable, who tells me that he loves the Pravi sector and that believes the Pravi sector will control all of Ukraine in the future. And he really feels quite comfortable with that idea. And that's the worrying thing is that the opposition was so weak that the Pravi sector and Svoboda were the ones who seemed like they were doing something, the ones that were driving and the ones that were galvanizing. So moderate Ukrainians have gravitated towards these extreme right-wing ultranationals in places that you really wouldn't have expected that to be the case. Alexander, this is, I'm very glad that Graham told us that because <clears throat> if we go before all of these major events, go back to November, mm. um, private sector, so Baldi, these parties w- were not popular. They, they had some seats in parliament, but they were a very limited number. Now, it either goes, in my mind, one way or the other. These people can, are unelectable, and they're not mm. going to look forward to an election. And if there is an election, they're not going to be in power, but they want to keep power because they will say, we won it through, we liberated Ukraine. Again, th- this is the next stage of the Ukrainian story that I really worry about. The fundamental problem is that what we have in the Ukraine at the moment is essentially a revolutionary situation. People there gained power through revolutionary, not electoral, democratic, constitutional methods. And in any situation where there is a revolutionary change of power, the revolutionary minority um, is usually very reluctant to give up the power that it has won. And that always creates an extremely volatile and unstable situation, given that it is nearly always, and I think in the Ukraine, in spite of what we've heard, it is a very small minority indeed. Now, the problem is it's also a very violent minority. (laughs) This isn't uh, something that, again, people in the West like to talk about, but those of us who followed the events in Kiev over the three months could see it for themselves, how violent it was. And so there is, it seems to me, a real potential for things to go badly wrong. So when Mr. Yatsenyuk, for example, says, and he's the sort of moderate face here, that we're going to have decentralization in the East and South, and we're going to have Russian as a language in those places, there is at the same time as all that is happening, we have people like Pravi Sektor, um, Svoboda, people even to the right of these organizations 
who are not going to be happy with any of that and who are going to be looking to undermine it and that and who are violent and who are dangerous. Dima, how do you square the circle then? Xander is absolutely correct. Yes, and uh, I'm afraid that we're going to see more of that. You know, what makes me sad is the fact that what we see is an intellectual degradation of uh, media and of general vision of what's going on in Ukraine. And that's both inside Ukraine and outside Ukraine. Outside Ukraine, especially in the United States, you have this Hollywood vision of, of, of the events in, in Ukraine where you have the bad guy, namely Putin, who is uh, doing some sort of aggression against a squeaky clean, nice nation ruled by Democrats who have just overthrown a dictator who was shooting his own people. You know, oh, the usual. Shooting his own people. Yeah. Uh, that's now almost as common as happy ending in Hollywood movies. On the other hand, inside Ukraine, uh, we have what Gramsci has just just uh, described, we have these simplified solutions, private sector and Svoboda, and unfortunately a lot of people from this, uh, even from the so-called moderate <coughs> Batkivshina party, who includes such people as Andriy Parubi, you know, the real founder of Svoboda, which used to be National Social Party of Ukraine. So their solutions are also very easy. We are going to topple Lenin's monuments, we are going to liaise closer with the European Union, we are going to drive the Russians out, life will be beautiful. <laughs> and uh, in fact, Ukraine doesn't need simple solutions because there is no simple solution. You have this huge country with its underdeveloped, basically agrarian West, with its industrialized East, whose in in Soviet industrialization is more of a problem than a solution right now. And you have countries and political leaders who are not suggesting viable solutions. Christopher Walker, I find it really interesting if we go back to the Newland tape. After everything, how much responsibility does the European Union have and the United States have now for <coughs> taking care of, quote-unquote, the rest of Ukraine? Well, I mean, it's undefined. They're not totally at harmony on this either. Don't forget it. Wasn't, <laughs> That's an understatement. Yeah, it wasn't That's long ago that uh, <laughs> expletives that cannot be repeated on family radio were used by the uh, member of the Secretary of State of the U.S. about the uh, European Union. And I think the most bizarre aspect of this, speaking as a Westerner, a European and a Brit who's facing an election in a year, is that one and a half of Europe's fight to get out and yet you've got these sort of revolutionaries <laughs> as Antonius rightly describes them I don't know if that's a pretty polite word for them actually a ragtag bobdale of uh, sort of afternoon hippies I'd call them but anyway struggling to get in uh, and I mean it's quite obvious the ones to get in wants to put their nose in the trough and the ones getting out wants to get their trough back because it's pinching all their wallets. It's an extraordinary situation. I think one thing that must come out of it, frankly, is that the European Union's attempt to become a sort of foreign power with this strange lady who's never been elected to a woman's institute touring around, uh, you know, I can't even, uh, Ashdown, uh, the, the one the French says has a face who looks as though it's been run over by a steamroller. But anyway, uh, <laughs> not the most elegant of diplomatic ladies. There she is, rootling and tootling into Kiev on jets the whole time, holding meetings. I mean, who does she represent? Not even her own <laughs> Labour Party. The one thing they wanted to do in Britain was to get her out out and send it to Brussels. Graham, let me go to you. What is the perception of the United States and the European Union now after we have these events playing out in Crimea? You get a sense now of, of everything in Ukraine being reversed and, and flipped around and nothing being as it was before without any sense that it can ever return to as it was. I was in Odessa for the demonstrations here um, at the start of March when City Hall was surrounded, was ring-fenced by pro-Russia activists and then you had pro-Ukrainians turning out and they were each accusing the other of not being from, I mean, for example, on the Ukrainian side, they're saying that the pro-Russians are Russians. Uh, on the Russian side, they're saying that the pro-Ukrainians <coughs> are Ukrainians uh, from the Lviv, that is, they've been bust in. This is what everyone's talking about is bust in from Lviv, bust in from Russia. So you, you do get a sense of these fissures which have come and this country now which has been set against uh, itself but also against other parties. I've had people um, shouting at me in the street thinking that I'm an American um, and, and swearing at me. In fact, I had a woman near Lugansk who spat in my face because uh, she said I was American, we don't need you. And she said to me in the strongest, most industrial Russian language, 
uh, go back to America. And then, of course, you know, I explained that I'm from England and it, and it modulates it somewhat. But by that time, you know, I've already had my face spat in. So, I mean, I had a woman uh, ranting, and I would use that word in the most eloquent sense in Kharkiv, passionately espousing the fact that why on earth is Yatsenyuk in America? Um, she said, begging to Obama, well, we're right next to Russia, our brothers and our biggest trading partner. Why is he doing that? So you really feel a sense of a country that has been set against itself and given them all these causes for conflict uh, with each other. I mean, you've got pro-Euromaidan and anti-Euromaidan with the Lenin statues. Of course, you have pro and anti that. And it doesn't divide down the ages quite simply by saying that old people um, are pro-Lenin and young people are anti. I had 11-year-old uh, girls that I videoed in uh, Nikolaev saying that they felt really upset that Lenin was gone. And of course, I had older people. And there's, there's real upset because if you see what actually has been left in the wake of these monuments, it's in some cases, it's, it's extremely ugly. It's basically defaced plinths, which well, before Ian, were I, home to these rather grand to... and these regal monuments that have basically been vandalized and defaced and that now are, are eyesores. And a lot of people said to me, even if they weren't for Lenin, they said, well, look, if you're going to destroy something, then you should at least propose a better alternative. And that kind of feels like a microcosm for Ukraine L to me, which let is let me it's go destroyed, to, go to but there isn't a better alternative. Alexander Graham brings up some excellent points mm. here because we've all talked about a symbolism, ideology, senses of identity, ethnicity, but Alexander, the economy is going over a cliff. Absolutely, and on the 1st of April it loses its gas discount, it's not getting the rest of the Russian loan that it was supposed to be getting. One has to wonder uh, to what extent the Russians are going to be prepared to keep their markets open to Ukrainian industrial goods. The budget is apparently in crisis. I read somewhere a report that only 15% of the budget is at the moment covered by taxes, and apparently the gas reserves are extremely low, lower than they have ever been. So all all of these problems are mounting and there doesn't seem to be because we've had all these discussions about other things going on over the last few weeks there doesn't seem to have been any real plan or project put together to know how to deal with that and this is I'm afraid where we come back to the Russians because the United States has offered 1 billion dollars in loan guarantees the European Union has offered 1.6 billion euros there's talk of an IMF loan none of this is going to work realistically unless economic links with Russia are going to be maintained. So possibly we might start to see some kind of diplomatic activity to get around that problem, which will involve accepting some of the things that the Russians are saying. If that well, doesn't <laughs> happen, we could have an economic collapse with all kinds of further problems on top of the problems we have already. Dima Babich sitting right next to me. I agree with Alexander. I think a reasonable person would. But everyone's talking about sanctions in the <laughs> West. So how do we do? You can't have both. Well, let my friends correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I don't really believe in strong sanctions uh, in the near future for a very simple reason. The sanctions that can be applied without a substantial cost for the European Union and the United States. All of these sanctions are already in place now. I mean, this is not the first crisis between Russia and the West that we have been having, especially during the last 15 years since uh, Kosovo. So when the European Union says, oh, we're going to put on hold negotiations on the visa-free regime between Russia and the EU. But they already did that. Well, the problem is these negotiations have been dragging on since 2003. Putin first came up with the, the initiative of these negotiations. 90% of Russians were skeptical about that. We all expected these negotiations to drag on for 20, 30, 40 maybe years. So it's not really going to bite if these negotiations are put on hold for a year, two or three. So I would say that the West with the sanctions is in a position of a boxer who have been making so many small strikes all the time that he has his hand outstretched and now when he needs to make an impressive blow he simply has no leeway a and the other sanctions that could really bite they're going to cost the West much and we have seen with uh, the situation in November when it was enough to pay 10 or maybe 20 billion euros to have Yanukovych actually sign the deal the EU failed to come up with these funds okay Christopher again I start the program being worried and I'm gonna wind it up being worried Ukraine is about to collapse and that's going to impact Russia in a negative way, and it will impact the European Union in a negative way. How do we get everybody on board? Because it has been pointed out on this program, there was the option of a trilateral a commission where all three parties, European Union, Ukraine and Russia, 
could sit down. When are we going to get there? Because it's the only way out. I, I agree with you totally. I was just going to say, until you said it yourself, that that has got to be the only way out. Uh, let's just disregard military. It's too horrible. You'll mm. be so depressed, you'll get your hanky out if that happens. But it's got to be some form of trilateral. I think also, perhaps, what's got to happen is that uh, the Americans and the Russians somehow or other have to sort of overlook this small boil on their arm and think about their total relations, which this is a symptom of. You are now sort of running out of endless histories of the Crimea. Uh, you know, they're even printing the wrong photograph of the charge of the light brigade. They, they can charge, put into the charge of the heavy brigade. It's extraordinary. It, it, the nuts and bolts are done. And as I said at the beginning, I stick by it, it's a done deal. But let it's not a done deal that America and Russia are falling further apart. And behind this, you've got F-16s revving up, ready to go to base in Poland. You've got all sorts of anxieties amongst the East European members of the EU. I think somebody's got to get them by the scruff of the neck and uh, say, look, let's look at the real picture. But I, I can't see okay, how he's going to do it. Graham, if I can go to you, it seems to me all of the players, when we go from the United States, the European Union, all the sides in Ukraine and Russia, we're all fighting over the seating order on the Titanic right now. You could almost say that losing Crimea uh, sanction on Ukraine. Um, I mean, this really is the gold territory of, uh, of Ukraine. This is 26,000 kilometers of Ukraine's most beautiful agriculture, of Ukraine's prime tourist attractions. It gets 6 million of Ukraine's 20 million tourists a year. And so losing Crimea for Ukraine is is devastating. For Ukrainians, it's devastating. They've woken up and effectively they've lost really what is the jewel of their country. That is a sanction. And that's something that I feel that Ukraine has to accept for engaging in a system which has put into place a government which is undemocratic, which is unelected, and which is neo-Nazi, which now believes Svoboda, that they can go marching into state TV channels, uh, making mm -hmm. uh, CEOs write resignations uh, under mm -hmm. physical assault, under duress, and that that's absolutely acceptable. So I think it's, it's, and I really like Ukraine a lot. I've lived here for four years. I have a lot of love for the country, but I think you have to say that, look, you know, if you went along with Euromaidan, you made your choice and you have to accept this sanction, which is losing the best part of your country. Um, and that is as it stands today. Uh, and that's the situation that's a direct result of Euromaidan is that Ukraine's lost Crimea and Crimea is never coming back. And in fact, if you speak to the Crimeans, as I did and I spoke to hundreds, one man even said to me, look, he said Crimea being in Ukraine was an accident and it was an accident they they were prepared to tolerate. But under this new Ukraine, they've stood up and they've and they've opted out. And I think they deserve respect for that. And if we're talking of sanctions, I think we have to involve the loss of Crimea uh, in that equation. Alexander, it seems to me, and listeners know I have strong opinions, but this is all the European Union's fault. On February 21st, there was an agreement. There was an agreement mm. for institutional changes, for elections, and, and, and everyone, maybe no one got everything they wanted, but so everybody got something. And I, f I feel very strongly that the European Union let the Ukrainian people down, all of them. It completely let it down. And if we go back to the 21st of February agreement, the European Union is its guarantor. They signed it. Three, three European Union foreign ministers, those of Poland, Germany and France, signed it. It was ripped up on and there the was following... A Russia, and there was a Russian representative in the room. There was a Russian representative yeah. in the room. And they ripped it all up the following day. And they immediately acknowledged the government that came into power illegitimately, unconstitutionally, undemocratically, in contravention of that very same agreement, which they violated. And, of course, they've been trying since then to get the Russians to talk to the present regime in the Ukraine, setting themselves up as the, as the mediators, without seeming to realise that these actions have completely taken away any trust, any possible trust in their position as mediators. Having said that, I think that the European Union is not a monolith. There are different players within the European Union. Southern Europe is not happy with this whole situation. They're not happy with this, with the way they've been led down into this, into this conflict. I suspect the Germans and the British quietly are not very happy with it either. And I come back to what Christopher said right at the beginning, with which I am completely in agreement. There's an awful lot of hot air about the Crimea. 
secretly everybody knows it's a done deal. Right, Quietly, let me jump in here. I'm going to give Dima. Ev- let me give Dima yeah. Bob. We're almost out yes. of time here. Dima, can you end on a positive note, or is that impossible right now? Well, I think uh, that there can be a positive note, and that is that Russia's policy now is going to be realistic. I think that in Crimea, what we saw, we saw how for the first time the disastrous policy of the United States and the European Union was really challenged for the first time in 25 years. Okay, that's a topic for another program. I want to thank Christopher Walker, Alexander Mikiris, Graham Phillips, and here with me in Moscow is Dmitry Babich. You've been listening to Voice of Russia's political discussion program, Debating Russia. I'm Peter Lavelle. Stay with VOR.